Great, thank you very much. So um, my name is Daniel Poon. I'm from the North South Institute based in Ottawa, Canada. And I'd just like to thank the organizers for this opportunity. I have more slides than minutes, uh, so I will just jump right into it. Uh, so this is the basic outline of my presentation. My main, main, main point is to really help detail the uh, role of capital account management or, or capital controls and or the connection with that and industrial policy in East Asia. And I'll focus particularly on China, but I would argue that that link is, is there for most of East Asian countries of Japan, ta Taiwan, and South Korea. And then I'm going to just quickly go into a comparative framework to help uh, differentiate different African countries with, with regards to uh, a, me a proxy measures of, of how globally um, how integrated they are to global financial markets. And this is hopefully to help identify countries with possibly more policy space uh, to conduct industrial policies. And then finally, a quick uh, look at inter inter international investment positions for three countries uh, that come out of that analysis. And then uh, a, a brief concluding an, a discussion. And just a quick note, I mean, I, I wasn't able to go as far as I wanted to with this paper in terms of thinking about how a, a country, this is the burning question, how a country that's already opened up uh, can put the genie back into the bottle, um, if I can put it that way, and, uh, and what kind of options are open to, to African countries that have opened up quicker, and whether the same policy, policy tools are available. Uh, so just to quickly get into this issue of, of uh, the role of capital controls in industrial policy, uh, this was an issue obviously with, dealt with in Asia, particularly in the Asian crisis, and this is my question, is it for Africa today? Now the question I asked this morning to the governor uh, uh, of the Central Bank of uh, Tanzania uh, more or less re uh, reinforced the point that I'm trying to make. Is basically with the, one of his, he did not mention the, whether or not capital controls uh, was a particularly important tool and how that influenced other tools, and, and this is basically my argument. And so here, Jagdish Bhagwati, um, you know, someone who's very pro-free trade and then now uses the language of freer trade, um, as well as noticing the fact that the financial sector is the soft underbelly of capitalism. I, I quite like that saying. Um, and, and, and also Paul Krugman, and that, that's a, a quote coming out of the Asian crisis, uh, basically pointing out that people just didn't want to talk about capital controls. And I would argue that this is similarly going on today with Africa. Put another way, um, of course, many countries uh, have different industrial plans and ambitions. Uh, what is less well understood is exactly the key factors that renders one industrial policy framework configuration different from another, and how that affects the availability of different instruments, uh, the, abil the ability to sustain domestic uh, mobilization of resources, as well as, which I think influences the effectiveness of implementation, implementation and the way that IP objectives are generally uh, formulated and uh, attained and adjusted over time. And as I put it, that's, that's the main contention of my paper, is that um, the capital controls as part of the macroeconomic framework should be at the crux of discussions of industrial policy. Now, just to dive right into it, now, the, the general assumption um, is, that, is that free capital flows is, is, is desirable, and that, that is assumed. And therefore, with the impossible trinity, uh, you know, free capital flow is a fixed exchange rate, and independent monetary policy uh, is incompatible, and you need to choose two out of the three. Uh, this is what some people have call, called uh, obliging to the hard corners of this triangle. And uh, I've definitely, my argument is that Chinese policymakers, as well as arguably Indian policymakers, have operated away from the hard corners, um, which is pretty much held to be the conventional wisdom. So the orthodox configuration would be cap open capital flows, uh, more or less floating exchange rate and a so-called independent monetary policy. But again, you'd have to uh, dampen that with concerns over inflation. So inflation targeting, I would argue, would, would take that independent monetary policy away. Um, and, in the, and in this less orthodox case of what I would, you know, China and India have been doing, but more so China, I would argue, um, is really to play with degrees of account, capital account management. So therefore, not free capital mobility. And therefore, that allows a certain amount of policy autonomy over exchange rates and, and interest rates and monetary policy. And sadly, I would argue that a lot of African industrial policy literature has not really delved into this. Or maybe from the 70s it has, but not since then. Uh, so just to quickly get into what, how the IMF, uh, just after the Asian crisis, financial crisis, 
kind of you know, stylize the so-called integrated approach to CAM, capital account management, is really uh, if you focus on the, so there's three stages, and so stage one, stage two, and stage three, and basically you start by liberalizing FDI flows, long-term flows, and then while you mainly focus on, on these long-term flows, um, you start focusing more on stage two and these short-term flows, but then also doing that, and sorry if you can't see that at the back, but you are you know, doing a range of institutional building such as uh, you know, statistical, improving statistical and accounting, revising legal frameworks, strengthening prudential regulation. So you're doing all these things uh, in stage two, uh, and then stage three is basically full liberalization because it's assumed that the economy is ready to, to pretty much manage risks all on its own. And, and so that, that was the assumption coming out. And obviously the Asian crisis was a big uh, player, a uh, big factor in, in the IMF at the time thinking about changing its articles of agreement. But I don't have the time to get into that, so I'll just keep on going ahead. So why capital controls? And, um, you know, study by Magood, uh, and I'll um, kind of outline the four fears. Uh, so I was thinking the other authors, I think it's Rogoff and Reinhardt are the other authors to that. Um, and so basically fear of appreciation is that you know, with, with uncontrolled capital inflows that your uh, currency will be affected by that and be increasing and then that'll price out domestic manufacturing and that will affect your economy through the <coughs> impacts through tradables and non-tradables. Uh, fear of hot money, again, basically surge in inflows to your, to your economy, which causes distortions uh, and misallocation of, of, of capital, but also the fact that this could possibly leave, uh, that, that, that hot money could leave and then leaving, um, leaving economic dislocation in its wake. And then again, fear, fear of large inflows, which is similarly um, this, this fear of money just you know, sloshing in and out of your economy. And, and the dislocations that would cause. And obviously the last one, fear of loss of monetary autonomy, which is what the Trinity was talking about, the impossible Trinity, uh, and the fact that you would uh, possibly leave, uh, ha have less policy options the more open you are to that flow. Um, so basically taking that four fears, uh, what Elarian and Spence writing for the World Bank Growth Commission is basically saying that, look, China and India approached reform using an idea called Reform, uh, model uncertainty, which you know, fits perfectly with the idea of, of these four fears out there. And uh, basically that, that because of this, this uncertainty which they embedded in their decision-making models, uh, leaders tended to treat advice from advanced economies with a, grain, with a large grain of salt, which instilled a form of pragmatism. Uh, and then that in turn led to the notion of a gradual and experimental steps in the timing sequencing of the current and capital accounts, as well as proceeding with export diversification. Now, just to kind of show this very briefly, um, it, this is three country cases of capital account opening as measured by the Chin Ito uh, index. And so what you see basically is South Korea and China uh, later very much doing a stepwise, um, I would say nonlinear kind of, and, and so, sorry, this, uh, this index is as, as you go up it's to one, it's completely open and zero is closed. And as you see with the green line, you have Bolivia, just kind of an example that I took, um, you know, starting out at a very high level of capital account liberalization and with the uh, debt crisis in the 80s having to change that mode, but then quickly thereafter opening up again. And that's just a very much different pattern um, as you see from these Asian countries that I've labeled here. Now, I don't want to, want to put too much into this because the Chen Edo Index does have its problems, um, but that will you know, provide a nice visualization for you. Uh, Five minutes, huh? So I'm just going to jump through this. This is just a very brief, detailed account of you know, how China slowly opened its capital account. I would say that in 2001, with the, its entry to WTO, its, it's, it's uh, promise to liberalize the financial sector fully within five years has not been, uh, has not been respected or, or adhered to. And just to give you an example, uh, you know, Beijing still controls access to its mainland stock market exchanges through programs such as the Qualified Foreign Institutional Investor, or QFII, so, uh, which was started in 2003. So by 2010, so seven years later, when supposedly you know, liberalization was supposed to take place in financial sectors, uh, the QFII quota was capped at 30 billion US, which represented still less than 1% of total market capitalization in the Chinese markets, uh, the mainland markets, which are about 3.5 to 4 trillion. 
Um, so that just gives you an example of some of that detail. What were the capital controls for? Well, there's a number of reasons for them, but, uh, and I, but basically to, you know, to channel resources as well as to maintain those resources, helping it insulate the exchange rate. You know, there's a whole list of them, and uh, basically capital controls can be used for different purposes. Again, the, they would also, the Chinese would also brought more broadly defined capital controls to include what they would call macroprudential measures. Uh, and that would include things that, that I've listed there um, that allow you know, the capital controls with these other measures, that, that that's, is what you know, is providing the room for maneuver in, in setting short-term interest rates. And, and uh, while also maintaining a degree of price stability without having to use inflation to discipline that uh, interest rate. And that's what Stephen Roach, uh, the former chief economist of Morgan Stanley Asia, calls you know, China's approach, the, the, the kind of classic central banking at its best. Um, and so just to give you a sense of this, this is, this is what leads to this investment-led type growth model where you can set interest rates rather low and, and not that they didn't worry about inflation, but they use other measures to deal with inflation. Uh, and so that, those arrows there are for t uh, Japan in its you know, formative years. Uh, and these are ones are for China. And so this elevated rate of investment is, what's, is what I think African countries are trying to get after, not just African countries, but mostly developing countries in general. And, and what does that allow you to do? Well, that is what allows you to invest in those factories, invest in the infrastructure. And, uh, and so this is, when you have a plan like this for say the renewable energy sector, well then, you know, if you have that financing, if you have that, that, that backing, uh, the, the resources at hand domestically, as well as foreign, to combine together, uh, these kinds of plans all of a sudden become much more realistic, as well as the fact that the China has built up its reserves and is able to, you know, to allocate them to certain kinds of areas for, for certain incentives, especially if its, if its SOEs at the bottom there are healthier and stronger. That's obviously going to make an impact for industrial policy in terms of uh, vehicles of, of implementation. Uh, another advantage would be the advantage to... to this is a graph kind of comparing World Bank loans to Africa versus Chinese Exim Bank loans. And as you see, the uh, gray overtakes the red by 2005. And, and that, you know, th this av availability of capital to the Chinese is also what's driving its interaction with the rest of the world, as not just in you know, accessing resources, but obviously also getting in technologies and accessing markets. So I don't know I'm running out of time, but just as an example, um, you know, when, for example, when Geely, the, the car maker, uh, the domestic car maker in China, bought Swedish automaker Volvo for 1.8 billion uh, back in 2010, uh, you know, mainly to access Volvo's technologies, engineering capabilities. Uh, the, you know, the deal was financed by a loan by the Bank of China, China Construction Bank, the Exim Bank, um, as well as as Geely itself and some of the local governments. But just mainly to, to kind of point the to make the really, you know, push the point home that access to capital essentially is allowing China to upgrade its capabilities as well. Uh, I, so, unfortunately, I won't be able to get too far into the rest of my presentation, but this is generally a, um, just policy trends of industrial policy as, as measured by the global trade alert. And as you see on the top left, it's the, the broadest categories, and you see Africa with the most number of countries with the least amount of uh, industrial policy measures, at, you know, or protections measures as measured, as, as recorded by this database. And the next one down looks at the BRICS and you see the number total in red. The red basically meaning that it is clearly dif uh, discriminating against foreign commercial interests. Um, and then you have on the right a breakdown of, of African, uh, at least some selected African countries and what they've done. And so there's different ways of measuring industrial policy performance and capabilities. Um, you know, for example, this upcoming African Transformation Report by the African Center for Economic Transformation includes a transformation index that will have five indicators, economic diversification, technology, productivity, export competitiveness, human dimensions of transformation. What I'm arguing is that we need to start looking at financial globalization. Um, this is just a broad, uh, the financial globalization as defined by external assets plus liabilities divided by GDP. Uh, here you have comparison between the BRICS and some developed countries. Developed countries are, are you know, several mul multitudes or multiples of uh, 
of their assets, of their gross assets, whereas you see, for example, in China, it's just reaching parity or a level of one. Uh, and Russia aside, you generally have a lower level of financial globalization um, in those markets. And so this is what I was getting at, and I'll just wrap up after this, is really to, uh, in the African situation, this is a, a, a quadrant analysis comparing de facto financial globalization with de jure financial openness. And so the bottom is de jure, what is on the books. And as you see, a lot of African countries on the, on, on the books look quite closed. But if you actually try to calculate or a, a proxy for the financial globalization, you see that there's a whole range, um, just as an earlier presenter had, had kind of pointed to, uh, of, of different uh, uh, exposure to financial global markets. And, and this is how that, that quadrant would look like. Uh, another way of doing that would just to, just to calculate the change over time. And uh, here are, it's surprising to kind of point, look at how, how um, that, that change in ratio is actually quite negative for most of the countries in this, in this uh, sample, which is only 30 countries. And, and I apologize for this going over time, but basically after that, I, I take Angola, um, Rwanda, and uh, Zambia to kind of look at their, their balance sheet um, performance, and basically you just, going over this quickly, just a rise in reserve assets. It's improving slightly, but they're still generally in, in a net negative position. And as you see at the top here with, you know, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain versus China, there's problems with balance payments data, but generally uh, they're rough, roughly right. Um, and so I will cut that off there. Thank you. We'll come back. Yeah.